With that said, we're going to be looking today at 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 14. And so let me read those verses to you. And as I do so, I'll go back and give you uh, some introduction, remind you of a few things that, that we've been looking at here in 1 Thessalonians, and then I'll move into those verses and take them apart for you, and we'll look at them together. So beginning at verse 12, reading to verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. So Paul is about to conclude his letter we call 1 Thessalonians, and what he's doing is he is concluding with instructions concerning what has been called life in the church. Now, as we've been going through 1 Thessalonians, we've seen that the believers have been going through great affliction and persecution. It was so severe that some had begun to think that they were in the tribulation. Now, how had that happened? How is it possible for the Thessalonians to begin to believe that they are going through the, the tribulation? Well, the answer is that false teachers had begun to infiltrate, and with the false teachers came bad doctrine. In his second letter in 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, Paul reveals what uh, they were saying as well as its effect. If you look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, here in 2 Thessalonians, he wrote, Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. And so these people were saying that the day of Christ, now the day of Christ is not the same as the day of the Lord. We looked at the day of the Lord, which is a time of judgment also being referred to as the tribulation. The day of Christ is different. The day of Christ refers to the rapture. And so some were beginning to think they were in the tribulation because they thought that the day of Christ had already come. And as a result of the teaching, the believers, he says, were shaken in mind as well as troubled. And so what is the effect of bad doctrine? Well, one, it's, it's that you are shaken. The word shaken simply means to be unsettled, to be agitated. When it speaks of being troubled, that means to be disturbed. It can even speak of being terrified. So the false teachers had crept in and began to terrify and shake up the Thessalonian church. And, and they were introducing their error in various ways. Notice again here in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, how it says, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by the word or by letter as if from us. And so basically what was happening is they were introducing their error by spirit. Now that would refer to false prophecies. And so they're hearing false prophecies that are taking place or by word. When it says by word, that would speak of uh, personal conversation with Paul or by letter, that would speak of a forged letter by the Apostle Paul. And so how is this error creeping in? Well, someone's standing up with a prophecy saying that this has taken place already. And others are beginning to say, yeah, that's true because I had a conversation with Paul. And then somebody else was saying, yeah, I have a letter from him that substantiates what we're saying. And that's what Paul was dealing with in 2 Thessalonians. You see, the false teachers had introduced error and these infiltrators began to upset the church. And because of that, Paul gives commands. Now, his commands are intended to protect them from the error of the false teachers. What is it, he, what is it that he's supposed to do? How can he preserve, preserve their unity? How can he encourage them to live at peace? How can that church survive? How can they be protected from the error that is beginning to undermine the foundations of the church? Well, notice with me that Paul directs their attention to the ones who are leading he says in verse 12 here in chapter 5, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. He points their attention to the leaders of the church. He's pointing to the ones who God has set in place to care spiritually for them. He's pointing them to their spiritual leaders. 
And the spiritual leaders are there to encourage them in their walks with Jesus Christ. And that's why he says in verse 12, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. We urge you. Now, why does he have to urge them? Because that's how he, what he says, we urge you, brethren. Well, he urges them because it's our natural tendency to fail to value the right people. We, as a nation, even to this day, we fail to value the right people. We have a tendency of valuing those that are not the right people. And so he's urging them because their natural tendency is to fail to value those who matter the most. And in their times of affliction, their times of persecution, it's their faithful leaders who are caring for them. They are literally taking their own lives into their hands as they're serving the body of Christ. And so he points their attention towards the ones who are suffering along with them. Now remember with me, let me give you a brief reminder here. Thessalonica was a very anti-gospel and extremely hostile city to believers. Thessalonica, during the time of the writing, was actually a dangerous place for a Christian to live. We remember in the book of Acts in chapter 17 how that Paul had ministered in this city and many in the city had come to faith in Christ and, and there was such a great response to the gospel. People were welcoming the message. But Luke also gave us the response of the unbelievers, the ones who were rejecting the gospel. He tells us that evil men gathered a mob and set the city in an uproar. And it was so dangerous that Paul had to be sent out of the city for his own safety. Now, he left, but the church remained, and the church went through terrible persecution. And Paul has been describing that in 1 Thessalonians. In chapter 1, verse 7, he had said that they received the word in much affliction. In chapter 2, verse 14, he said they suffered persecution from their own countrymen. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, he exhorted them not to be shaken by their afflictions and tribulations. They're going through affliction, they're suffering from their own countrymen, and they're not to be shaken. So in light of all of this pressure and all of this pain, what is the church to do? Well, they're to cling to what they've been taught. They're to walk in the light. They're to be alert. They're to be sober. They're to put on the, put on the breastplate of faith and love. They're to put on the helmet of hope. They're to rest in the fact that they were not appointed to wrath. Instead, as believers, they've obtained salvation. They're going to live forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only individually, but the entire church, those who have come to faith in Christ, will live together forever with him. And that's why they should comfort, which means to encourage, they should comfort one another and build one another up, edify one another. And that's what they've been doing. And this is what they must continue to do. Now, under all of this pressure, what else is going to help them not only to survive but to thrive in this atmosphere. Well, Paul at this point says you need to appreciate those who occupy the position of leadership in the church. Now, why would that be? Well, it's because the leaders are the most visible targets of persecution. They have undoubtedly paid a very high price for the work that they're performing, and the leader's faithfulness under fire should inspire them to hold fast to Jesus Christ. And that's why, verse 12, that's why he says, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you. The word when he speaks of and are over you, that's a word preside, are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And so that gives us uh, information concerning how that church can live in peace and unity. He said that these leaders are laboring, presiding, as well as admonishing. So what he's pointing to is the spiritual work of elders. He's pointing to the spiritual work of those who are leading the church. They are laboring. When he speaks of those who labor amongst you, that word laboring simply means to, to feel fatigue, to work hard, they are laboring not only physically, but they are laboring spiritually. Why? Well, ministry is hard work, and it's hard work not only physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. He speaks of them who are over them in the Lord. That means to preside. It speaks of exercising spiritual authority. They're the ones that God has given spiritual leadership to. They have charge over you. In 1 Timothy 5.17, he says it like this, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, 
especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So it, it's, it's a difficult work ministering. They labor in the word and doctrine. And he speaks concerning the fact that they admonish. The word admonishing speaks of reproving. It speaks of counseling. It can speak of warning. And so they admonish through the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. Now, why would you say that, Paul? Well, in difficult times, our own concerns outweigh other concerns. So Paul is saying that the Thessalonians should make an effort to know their leaders. And in doing so, they'll be in a better position to appreciate those who are serving. The people are going through affliction. But the chief target will always be the leader. One of the tactics of the enemy of our souls is to first attack the leaders. Every member whether serving presently or in the past, every member of the military knows that one of the tactics of our enemy is to take out the leaders first. When I was in the army, they gave us fatigues. In, in uh, earlier days, your rank would be visible. So you might have it on your arm. You might be a staff sergeant uh, whatever your, your, your uh, rank was, you'd have it. It was visible. But they took that because for us in the Army in the time I served in the Revolutionary War at that time, uh, it was in gold. So you would see it. It just stands out. But they ended up giving us uh, the different kind of ranks. With uh, They were black. So you wouldn't see them. And there was a reason for that because if you were out in combat and you had something that was visible, the first thing the enemy would do would go after the person with the stripes. That's what they do. They'll go after the person with the bars or whatever. That's what they do. And that's what you do in warfare. You take out the leader. You take them out. And so that's just a, a, a thing that happens. And in Matthew 26, 31, Jesus said, This night you will all fall away on account of me, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. You take out the leader. And so what is it that the enemy does? The enemy works to, to destroy a, a church. And so he concentrates on the leadership. Now the church should remember that the leaders are also suffering. Sometimes the church doesn't realize that. The leaders are also not only under physical attack, but the leaders of the church are under spiritual attack. And that knowledge should provoke the church to value them for their service. And because of this... Paul urges the church to recognize those who are laboring among them. That word recognize is a simple word. It, it means to appreciate. You need to appreciate, Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, those who are laboring. Now, where would sincere appreciation originate? Well, notice in verse 12 he says, Recognize those who labor among you, are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And so it comes through acknowledging and valuing them as messengers of Christ and the gospel. As shepherds, they are entrusted, entrusted with God's word. Now, in 1 Thessalonians earlier in chapter 2, Paul had said, we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. The leaders have been entrusted with God's word and the leaders are faithfully delivering God's word to them and the believers, those members of the fellowship are to appreciate and be thankful for these faithful messengers. And these men are proven and they've been given responsibility to teach the word of God. They've been tested, they've been approved and they've been entrusted with the gospel. And their character and their faithfulness and, and their doctrine meets the standards that God requires. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, it says, it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And because of this, the church is to honor and value these faithful servants. These have been found faithful. They should be loved and highly respected. Verse 13 says, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. The word esteem means to regard Regard them very highly. Paul is saying that the church 
should have an extraordinary amount of love for them. An extraordinary amount of love for them. And it's a deeply spiritual love that actually produces appreciation, respect, and response. Now, someone asks the question, why, why would I do that? What's a big deal anyway? I remember a guy who was talking to me once, many years ago now, and he says to me, I, I, I would like to be a pastor. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. He says, that way I could play golf every day and only have to work one day out of the week. And so I told John, you'll never get on staff saying things like that. As a matter of fact, you're fired. You know, a lot of people don't understand the work of ministry. Paul does, and Paul has shared with them that these people need to know. It's interesting to note that, that these people, that the body of Christ, that the church in Thessalonica actually had to be instructed to love those who already loved them. They had to be taught to esteem them highly. When it speaks in verse 13 and says, esteem them very highly, this is, is another word, as I mentioned a moment ago, that, has, that says, have an extraordinary high amount of love for them. An extraordinarily high amount of love for them. Again, someone says, so what? What's the big deal? Why should I have this kind of love for these people? Well, ministers often labor long hours. And they, they grow very tired as they labor. In First Thessalonians, earlier in chapter 2, verse 9, Paul had said, you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Now, long hours can be hard, but long hours aren't unlike any other work in terms of just the hours that are worked. The difficulty of ministry is that the labor performed is spiritual. And the minister works on something that is never finished. You can have a job, as many of us in this room do, and you may be worker, a worker in construction, and so you build houses, and you build certain portions, we'll say, of that house, and you're contracted to do, to do that. Your company goes in and does certain things. And you'll go in after everything has been approved and everything is permitted and all, and you'll go in, and you'll begin the work. Eventually what happens is that work is complete, Eventually what happens is the neighborhood is done or the house is built and, and you just leave and you go someplace else and do it again. In ministry, that's not true at all. We labor on something that's never completed, the body of Christ. Our work is for a lifetime. It isn't for three months, six months, a year, or even two. It, it is for forever. You labor and never complete the labor. I spoke to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, uh, one time about this, and I remember sharing with him concerning it because a long time ago now, my pastor had spoken about retiring out of ministry and all, and he was nearing the age of 65, and 65 came, and 65 went, and, and he hadn't uh, retired, and so I was with him. We were having a meal together, and I said, you know, Chuck, you have said that you're going to retire. I'm just wondering why you haven't. It's not that I want you to, of course, but you said that at 65 you were going to retire, and that came and that went. May I ask you why you didn't retire? He said, you know, David, I was raised in a time when a man's goal was to retire at 65. He said, so I just said, kind of just was flowing with that, uh, that mentality. He said, and then it hit me one day, as a minister, as a preacher of the gospel, Every day I have with Jesus and I experience his grace and love is another day of experience of the loving grace of God that I can give to somebody else. And I realized that I had much work to continue doing. And Pastor Chuck continued to do that. I still remember talking to him later on again about the same subject, but I wasn't really talking to him this time. I was just telling him something. I said, you know, Chuck, you've taught us how to do a lot of things, but you never taught us how to retire. And he smiled and he said, because ministers don't. And my pastor was busy producing a Bible study for the week that he was, he was in. Uh, and he died while he was still preparing that study. He died in the saddle. He died in, as a faithful minister ought to 
working and serving the Lord. And people don't know that. They just think, well, he's gone. He's gone to his glory. But he worked to the very end. And that's the example of the pastor I had. That's my example, Pastor Chuck Smith. They work long hours. They, they do things and they get drained. Why? Because the work is not just physical. It's not just the hours. It's spiritual in nature. They're working on something that is never finished. And the minister works through the word of God and prayer in order to build up the body of Christ. In Colossians 1, 28 and 29, Paul said, Concerning Jesus, him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So the minister's work is continuous, and his labors are opposed every step of the way by the enemy, because Satan desires to undermine the work of God in the life of a believer. The minister work drains him of physical and emotional strength. And in many ways, it's the emotional and spiritual warfare that is the hardest. As I read, read my scriptures, I encourage you to do the same, obviously. But as you read 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, it's one of Paul's most open-hearted letters that he wrote to the church. And you can go through 2 Corinthians and you can look at uh, all the chapters and all, and you'll get to the point of seeing that in 2 Corinthians, Paul, uh, and I have it written down here just to remind myself, no less than 24 or 25 times, no less than 24 or 25 times, Paul has to defend his ministry. It's one of the most open-hearted messages that you find as Paul is writing to a Corinthian church where in 1 Corinthians he said, though you may have 10,000 instructors, yet you have but one Father. I begot you in the gospel. And yet when you get into 2 Corinthians, he's saying, what? Do I need letters of recommendation as others do? I'm the one who begot you. Because there's a church in Corinth, remember that church came through my efforts in the Lord. And yet these false teachers had entered into the Corinthian church. And as they came in, they began to undermine the work of this faithful minister. And so by the time he's writing 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, he begins to share with them his credentials. He has to let them know these are the things that I as a minister have gone through. And these are things that we ought to appreciate about ministers. And he was speaking concerning his effective calling. He's speaking of the things that he, he's endured. And, and he wrote, he wrote of labors and stripes. He, he, he uh, wrote of imprisonments and death threats. He spoke of physical pain that he endured. He had received 39 stripes. He had been beaten with rods three times. He suffered stoning. He had been shipwrecked. He spent a night and day in the deep. In his journeys, he suffered various dangers as he traveled to preach the gospel. He said, I've grown weary as I've ministered. I've, I've experienced sleeplessness and hunger and thirst. He said, I suffer the cold because he often had insufficient clothing. He said, these are the things that I've endured for the sake of the gospel and to take care of you. And what touches me is how he closes his list of things he endured. What is the thing that was most on his mind? He says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. All of these things, the labors, the stripes, the beatings, all of it pales in comparison to my desire for you guys, he said, to love and know Jesus Christ. That's what pales in comparison. Why should these people, again here in 1 Thessalonians 5, why should they esteem them highly in the Lord? He says, you do so for their work's sake. You treat them with love and respect because they are under enemy fire, but even so are continuing their care for you. And you not only are to love them for their personalities or their capabilities, your love should be deeper. Your love should be based on the spiritual work that they are performing. What is their work? Well, their work is to teach you about Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, my own pastor, Chuck, a moment ago, I loved him for many reasons. But the deepest reason I had for loving my pastor 
is because he helped me to see and love the Lord Jesus Christ more deeply. And the greatest reason to esteem a minister highly is if they help you to see him. You see, in our day, people can have a love for their home church, and they do for many reasons. They can love their worship teams. They can love their children's ministry. They can love the special events that they have a chance to enjoy. They can love hearing the powerful testimonies or the amazing growth of the church. They can love hearing of the pastor's stories of his travels or the spiritual adventures he finds himself on. They could be attracted to the minister's Bible knowledge or his passionate teaching, his prophetic insight, his impressive educational background, his vocabulary, his humor. You can be attracted to a variety of things, and, and all of those things contribute to a person's love for their church and a ministry. But the most important thing to love is very basic. In that church, you learn about Jesus Christ. And in that church, you're provoked to love them. That's why. I get emotional. Forgive me. I, don't, I hate it when I do. I hate it when I do. But that's... That's the foundation of this church. That's the foundation of this church. We want to give in every way today's society an opportunity to be blessed in a church service that has wonderful, wonderful worship and events and great people who work and serve here. We have such, we couldn't do all that we do if we didn't have so many volunteers and I'm so grateful for the volunteers that we have in this church. I really am. I'm very grateful. But it's all for nothing if you don't walk out loving Jesus more. It's all worthless. It's wood, hay, and stubble. But if you can walk out saying, I want to know more of Jesus. I want to serve him. Then we in this ministry are doing what we're supposed to do. In that church, you have to be able to walk out and say, I know Jesus better. I learn about him. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So the reason the church is to love their ministers is simple. By teaching and example, they help the people see Jesus clearly. You esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. What they were doing for the people was out of love and concern for them, and they sincerely desired for them to be at peace and to grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. Again, the heart of a true and mature shepherd is centered on one basic desire, that the people that they're caring for will mature in their faith and their service to God. You see, a true shepherd is a gift from God. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, Paul said that he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. When it says he gave some, he's speaking of a gift that God gave to the church. He gave some to the church who were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So a true shepherd is a gift from God to the people. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in chapter 3, verse 15, God said this. He said, then I will give you, that speaks of a gift, I will give you as a gift shepherds after my own heart. Who is in Scripture referred to as a shepherd after God's own heart? King David. I will send you, I will give you as a gift shepherds after my own heart like King David himself who will lead you. The word lead is actually to feed you who will lead you, who will feed you with knowledge, knowledge of God and understanding, understanding of his ways. I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will, lead, who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. I will give you people who know me, people who are shepherds, people who are after my own heart, not people who are building their own empire, building their own uh, celebrity, 
but people who are building you up in Jesus Christ. That's what shepherds do. You see, the shepherd's spiritual love language is revealed in many ways, including teaching. And the response of the people to the teaching of the word reveals their love for their shepherds. And through the receiving God's word, as well as obedience to the word of God, that produces within those who are teaching them great joy. That's why 3 John verse 4, the apostle John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So the response to the word is what becomes evidence that they're saved. Their, their hunger for the word is how people know Jesus and remain steadfast. And that should provide them with the proper motivation to live honorably for the Lord. He says, so this is why we urge you to appreciate, to recognize those who labor and become tired among you, are over you, who preside over you with authority in the Lord and admonish. They encourage you and challenge you and esteem them, love them deeply. Again, this, why should I care about them? There's so many places I can go, so many teachers and so many churches. I can turn on the radio and listen. I can turn on the television and watch. I can go online and, and view. Why would I care for them? over the people that are much better and much more gifted. Well, the reason you do that is because the person on the radio or the person on the online service or the person on the television isn't going to be there for you when you need them. They're not going to perform your wedding. And they're not going to perform your funeral. They're not going to be there to counsel you when you lose somebody. They're not going to be there to hold you when you weep. They're not going to be there. In ministry, it's much more than just being able to give a good speech. Paul said, I gave you not only the word, but my very life also. I didn't give you just Bible studies. I gave you all of me. And that has been my inspiration. Again, my, my pastor Chuck showed me that. And that's what we have wanted here. And no, this isn't going to be a self-serving message. Don't worry about it. I'm just opening a little bit of my heart to you. That's what we built this church on. There's no other foundation other, one that, other than the one that's already been laid, which is Christ Jesus. Our desire is for you to walk out saying, I know more of Jesus. And should the Lord lead you someplace else that you will leave reluctantly knowing that in this fellowship you were loved. And the best way that I as a pastor can ever show love to a church with many people I'll never really know is to try and give you the most clear Bible study I can give you, to give you the best meal that I can prepare. And there are other better cooks, and thank God for them, of course. But while you're here, I've said this many times, I will give to you the best study I can give you. And I give to you not just the word of God, but I've given you my heart too for 43 years. I have remained faithful to you. And that's just the way it is. And so I, I do understand what it means to esteem them highly because when my father had gone home to be with the Lord, I sat down with my own pastor, Chuck, at a pastor's conference. And I sat next to him, and I have known pastor. I knew him for a long time, and so I turned to him, and, and I said, uh, Chuck, I said, you know, my father went home to be with the Lord. He actually, uh, I had spoke to, spoken to him the day after my dad had gone to heaven, and, and uh, sometime on, on the phone, I remember Marie had called Chuck and said, uh, my father-in-law went to heaven, and I still remember Marie telling me, that Chuck said, oh, David really loved his father. And so I got on the phone, I spoke to him for a moment. And uh, 
so I saw him later on, and when I saw him, I said, you know, Chuck, I said, you know, my dad went to heaven, and he just sat there quietly, and I said, uh, and now you're my father, and now you're my father, and I didn't mean he took the place of my dad. I meant that he became a counselor and had a father figure in my life the way my dad had. My dad obviously could never be replaced, but Pastor Chuck was able to fit in my spiritual life in a very powerful way. Who's your father? Who do you have that can say, you can say in your heart, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm learning from that. That's what Paul is saying. Esteem them highly. Esteem them highly for their work's sake because they pour into you, not just themselves, but Jesus Christ. And with all of this, he goes on and we'll close. He goes in verse 13, the last portion. Be at peace among yourselves. We exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. And so he's transitioning to conclude. And notice again in the second portion of verse 13, be at peace among yourselves. Now, why would he include this in his instructions as he's saying appreciate leaders? It would be because division always undermines effective ministry. Division is one of the oldest and most basic tools of Satan. Jesus pointed that out. Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And so he's saying, be at peace amongst yourself so you can continue to do the work. So unity in the Lord is pursued and guarded. Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So when appreciation exists between the minister and the congregation, there's peace. So be thankful. Be encouraging to those who serve you in ministry and love one another, and serve together, and appreciate the depth of relationship. And then he says in verse 14, uh, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. So he closes, and he closes with, with four orders to the elders. This is intended to safeguard the unity and peace of the church. So first he says, warn. Warn those who are unruly. This is interesting, I'll say this briefly. But he says, caution. The word warn means to caution, exhort. Exhort those who are unruly. The word unruly is a word that was used at that time for those who didn't show up to work. This describes lazy, undisciplined soldiers who were not pulling their weight. So he says, exhort the lazy, undisciplined members who are not pulling their weight. Exhort those who refuse to work, but expect someone to care for them. Exhort those to pay for their own school bills. Exhort them. I'll let that settle for a moment. <laughs> All right. What, one brief thing. I married my wife when she was a um, college student. I believe she had graduated and we had gotten married. And... Uh, she had student loans. And so I inherited those. And thank God she went to Cal Poly. It wasn't that expensive at that time. But we paid them off. I didn't expect taxpayers to do that. I didn't expect somebody else to handle business that wasn't theirs. Marie had chosen to get her bachelor's degree, and she got it. Why would I expect somebody else to pay for something she had taken a loan out for? And when we bought our homes, I didn't expect anybody to give me a gift to buy a home. I expected to pay my own bills because that's what men do. We pay our own bills. And I don't expect someone else to do that for me. And in the early church, you had people who were walking around unruly, expecting others in the church to pay their bills. That's very practical, and it's right in front of you. And Paul says, you warn them, exhort these lazy, undisciplined members because they're not pulling their own weight. Each member should be encouraged 
to not be so self-centered they expect others to care for them, but encourage them to care for others. And teach them to be aware that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And warn them because disorderly members disrupt and burden the body of Christ. So first, do that. Second, comfort the faint-hearted. Now, the faint-hearted would be soldiers who think the enemy is too great for them. So encourage those who are feeling overcome by pressure. Have a listening ear, a tender heart, and be encouraging to them. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Remember that the battle is the Lord's. Remember that great problems will only give God great opportunities. And in Romans 8.31, remember how Paul said, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then third, uphold, which means to support the weak, those who are spiritually weak, uphold them through the word of God and love them. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then fourth, he says to the elders, be patient with all. Don't give up on the church. Love is patient. Sadly, some of us are very difficult to be around. That's a fact. I know none of you are. I know you're all precious and loving. I get it. But some of us, some of us have people in our lives that are very difficult to be around. We usually call them our husband or wife, but they are. They could be very difficult. Or children. Never our grandchildren, but our children. Be patient with the church. Don't give up on it. Don't give up on working through problems that you have. Because remember this, wherever you go, you take you with you. And you take your problems everywhere you go because they're in you. And instead of working them out, you just go somewhere else. The problem's still with you. And sometimes I've seen this, and this is a sad thing, and this is why this has to be in Scripture, obviously, is sometimes a person who's had the problem will leave and take their friends with them, and then they multiply that problem in the new place they go. So instead of working it out there and dealing with it as Christians, we just stay infected with our anger or hurt or disappointment, and we just move from place to place and never deal with it. So he says, be patient. Let the love of Christ overwhelm and be willing to, to, to work together to solve this problem. You can't be impatient with anybody because you love them. You see, without the love of God, all spiritual, moral, or intellectual gifts have no value. That's because on earth, all of these gifts have a limited amount of time. But God's love is permanent. And one of the ways God's love is revealed is through patience. That's why 1 Corinthians 13, 4 is so simple when it says love is patient. It holds on. And loving one another safeguards the work of the Lord, the unity of the church, and the testimony in the community. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. One last thing, and then we'll close with prayer. This is the prayer that I have prayed for over 53 years. Because, and I'll say this quickly again, I came from a background where you just say what's on your mind. And it wasn't even a mean. It wasn't intended to be mean. It was just, I thought it was honest. My mom was that way. And Mama would just tell you directly. So in the Rosales household, we were straight. Boom, boom, boom. You know, past the beans. I mean, that's the way we were. Bang, bang at the dinner table. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, I'll take that. We were just that way. I, then I meet a young woman from the opposite. She's quiet. They don't say what's on their mind. They keep it to themselves. So now I'm married to somebody like that, and I'm leading the way I think I'm supposed to by telling her this is the way it is. This is how we do it. Do you understand? <laughs> and she would just look at me. 
So I thought I was a great communicator. I got these things done. <laughs> and 20 minutes later, I'd find out what she was thinking while I was talking to her. And then I came to realize that there are different ways to approach the same thing. And so a husband is a dwell with a wife according to knowledge. And so I better figure out how I can best communicate. But secondly, and this is the point I'm making, I had better learn how to speak the truth in love because I don't do that very well. I was very direct. As a pastor, I was very direct. I would stand up here. I've been doing this a long time. And I'd say, bang, 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 bang. Boom, over, see you later. And I could still remember saying, I don't care if you love me. I don't. All I care about is you doing the right things. And if you don't like it, you know, don't let the door hit you when you leave. Now, I think I'm just being real. I really did. Until one day someone approached me and said, you know, when you said that, that hurt me. And I'm looking at him like, you weakling. <laughs> Why would you? And that was many years ago. So you'll see the tears and you'll see the sorrow and you'll, see, you'll hear the voice. Because God has broken me for so many years to teach me to love people and to say it in a way that they know. And part of the way that he breaks me is he humbles me because I show emotion, which I don't like to show. My wife can tell you, she hasn't seen me cry many times in all the years we've been together because I don't do that. The only place I really break down is here. It's the only place because I want to be transparent in my love for Christ to you and that's what I do and it's hard it's hard I don't like it I don't like it but I, 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 I will open my heart wide enough for you to enter in like Paul said I would only ask that you open your heart so I can into your heart also so we can love one another and do the work that God called us to do